Hello YouTube, welcome to my very first voice Star Rail Theory Crafting video. And today we'll be going over the Cooler Daniels kit, best gear, light cone options, teams, synergies, rotations, best ways to play him, and more useful tips. So let's get started with his base stats and the kit. These are his base stats at level 80. By virtue of being a destruction unit, he has a decent amount of base HP and defense. He has the second highest base attack in the game. As for the speed, he is going to be the fastest destruction character along with Arlen. He does have an energy cost of 140, which might seem humongous, but it'll make sense with this kit. Coming to his skill, it can enhance his basic attack up to 3 times. I'm going to refer to each one of his enhanced basics as levels. You can switch between these levels. You will consume 1 skill point at level 1, 2 at level 2, and 3 skill points at level 3 only after casting the basic attack. In level 2 or level 3 basic attack, I'll gain 1 stack of dominating roar before each hit, starting from the 4th hit. Each stack will increase his crit damage for a max of 4 stacks, which will last until the end of his turn. This would be useful when doing the basic attack into the ult combo. Next up is his basic attack. He has a standard basic attack that will generate skill points, which is the same as any other character. Then there is the three levels. Level 1 is a 3 hit single target attack. Level 2 is a 5 hit single target attack and from the 4th hit, it simultaneously deals adjacent damage. Level 3 is a 7 hit single target attack and from the 4th hit again, it does simultaneous adjacent damage. Then the ultimate is a 3 hit attack for both single target and adjacent and further gives 2 squama stacks. Each Squama stack is considered to be a skill point that can only be used by IL and he can possess a maximum of 3 of these stacks at one time. From his talent, he gains a stack of Righteous Heart after each hit in an attack. So this works for either the basic or the ultimate. Each stack will increase his damage percent for a maximum of 6 stacks and these stacks will persist until the end of his turn. As for the Trace nodes, the Ascension 2 Trace gives him 15 energy at the start of the battle. The Ascension 4 trace gives him 35% CC resist, which is very neat. And the final Ascension trace gives him 24% crit damage against imaginary weak enemies. On top of this, he unconditionally gets a total of 12% crit rate and 22.4% imaginary damage boost from the trace nodes. Finally, when his technique is activated, he enters the Leaping Dragon state for 20 seconds. In this state, he can move faster and when attacking, he blocks all incoming attacks which will guarantee you the first hit. When you enter battle after attacking in that state, you do AoE damage and gain 1 Squama stack. This is the same stack that was mentioned in the ultimate. My initial thoughts are that he is going to be playing the hyper carry role for your team who will be trading off skill points for more damage with his massive multipliers. On his max basic attack, he has 4 times the breaking ability as that of a standard basic attack, making him a very strong and consistent breaker as well. On top of that, he self buffs himself with damage percent and crit damage, with more crit rate, crit damage and damage percent coming from traces, making him quite independent. So you will just have to build teams around his weakness of consuming skill points by pairing him with skill point positive support and you will be good to go. For my damage calcs, I have assumed one single target plus one adjacent target instead of two, despite IL dishing out blast damage constantly. And the reason for that is the current design of MOC stages. You proceed in an MOC stage upon clearing elites or bosses, and up until now, and the MOC in the next patch all include a boss or elite or two elites or a combo of boss plus elite. You may have noticed in waves that have two elites or a boss plus an elite, they are always next to each other. This is still the case even when they have a summon mechanic wherein they spawn extra mobs, supporting the credibility of my assumption even further. So the question then becomes, how fast can a DPS character defeat two tanky targets spawning in a single wave? Note that it is indeed very nice to have the other adjacent attack clearing the adds, but it may not directly contribute to defeating the two targets faster. Reason for saying may is that the second adjacent attack may be beneficial in proccing certain passives such as the under the blue sky passive or the aeon passive. Or even Eidolon such as Pella's E1 or just straight up directly giving energy to IL upon defeating the enemy. 
These can be quite situational, but the point I wanted to make is that considering two targets is more realistic than three when clearing MLC. I feel that there is a misconception of needing 134 speed which may not be necessarily true. From the next MLC onwards, you will need to clear higher stages in 16 cycles, meaning you have 8 cycles for each half. There will be only 2 waves on each half from now. Considering the cycle number 0 on each of the 2 waves, you realistically have 10 cycles total for each half and 5 cycles total for each wave. Now let's see what 134 speed provides us in 5 cycles. So you get a total of 7 actions. Let's now compare this to 127 speed which IL will have with purely the speed boots. In this case you have 6 actions in total which is unfortunate, but let's see what happens if you have speed between 128 and 133. The performance from 128 to 133 is exactly the same as you can see. You get the same number of actions in all the cycles. So the only realistic difference between these and 134 speed is in cycle number 3 where 134 speed gets one extra action so if you happen to finish with exactly six actions with 134 speed that's the only time it's going to be better but if you have enough damage to finish the wave in five actions then all the speeds perform exactly the same so this just boils down to your gear and the content that you're facing in my opinion not having 134 speed is not that big of a deal as it may help you clear a cycle faster on one half and at best it may help you clear two cycles faster heavily depending on gear and content. If you are min maxing however then by all means go for that 134 speed. One thing that I would like to briefly mention is that if you have E1 Tingyun and if you are ulting every two turns on IL with 127 speed, you are effectively at 135 speed, so you don't need any speed from relics. But if you are ulting every three turns on 127 speed on IL with E1 Tingyun, you will be at 132 effective speed, so at least one speed substat is needed for a total of 134 effective speed. I'll be covering more about Tingyun and speed in the rotation section later on in the video. But overall, I'm gonna recommend a minimum of 129 speed normally, which is 1 speed substat and 134 speed if min maxing. Before we actually talk about his relic sets, I would like to show the distribution of his damage in order to have a better understanding of what to equip. More than 70% of his damage comes from basic attacking, meaning buffing his basics over his ult will yield more damage. Also, since you will be running him on speed boots and his kit or traces don't give any attack, going for attack person can be quite valuable, even with Aeon LC and Tingyun on the team. With that said, for the relic sets, 4-piece Wastelander is going to be his best in slot in terms of damage, even without considering any uptime on the crit damage passive, but this is with Pella or Solar Wolf for the debuff uptime. Having 10% damage boost on both basics and ults is very neat with nearly 100% uptime on the 10% crit rate and occasional 20% crit damage. Here's the relic set ranking so I can explain better. This comparison is done assuming 134 speed on every set which is why you see the 4-piece musketeer and 2-piece speed lower than what you would expect. There's only around a 5-6% to difference between 4-piece wastelander and the other sets so feel free to use the other sets if you have better stats on them. And of course, if you want the 134 speed, you could go for the 4-piece Musketeer. So what if we assume only 2 speed from substats? Every set will then be at 129 speed except 4-piece Musketeer and the 2-piece speed combination, which will be at 135. As stated previously, with this assumption, the speed buffing sets will perform better only if you manage to clear in 6 actions exactly. Otherwise, the other sets will do better. If you do manage to get 134 speed on the other sets or just have an even Tingyun, then they will definitely output more damage. As for the planar option, there's only 3 that are worth talking about. Unfortunately, using Wanwak and Tingyun puts you at 139 out of 140, making the 5% energy from Wanwak practically useless. So here's the ranking for the 3 sets. This one is obvious, but do keep in mind that for the arena set effect to work, you will need 70% crit rate without the help of 4-piece Wastelander. It's because the 10% crit rate actually doesn't count towards the 70% crit rate requirement. It only takes in the stats that show up on the stat screen before attacking. Since Isle does not have any follow-up attacks, Salt Soto ends up buffing only the ult, which is not ideal. Triple S does give you 24% attack, but it falls short in comparison to Arena's 8% crit rate and basic attack damage boost. 
for the body piece, run either CR or CD depending on LC and substats, but make sure you reach the 70% crit rate requirement for a two-piece arena. Without his LC, he starts at 25% crit rate with trace nodes and two-piece arena. So now you just need 45% crit rate. If you do opt for a CR body piece, you will still need 12.6% crit rate from substats. For a character without any crit trace nodes and without crit buffing LC, you will need 99.2 CV from relic substats for a 60-120 ratio. So if we apply the 99.2 CV in IELTS case, he will be at 70-124 ratio. Now with 4 piece Wastelander, 24 crit damage from his final trace and 2 broken keel supports on your team, he will finally be at 81-68 ratio. Note that you might benefit more if you trade your crit damage for more crit rate as he gives himself crit damage. And if you do have his LC, add 36 more CV to the 81-68 ratio. For the boots, just go speed. By using attack percent boots, you will only be going 5 times instead of 7 in the first 5 cycles and even at 110 speed, going 6 times is not giving you more damage than going 7 times with speed boots. As for the sphere, if you are pairing Isle with Ting Yun, the difference between attack percent and damage percent is very minute. In fact, it is a sub 1% difference in my case. This is because he gets 60% damage boost from his talent, so just use whichever one has better substats. As for the link rope, again, if you're using Ting Yun, you're literally 500 G off from 2 turn ulting, which can be easily obtained from just getting hit one time every 2 turns. This is very plausible in higher MOC, where elites and bosses keep spamming AoE and blast attacks. But for the sake of comparison, let's assume that you do not get hit at all. The difference between attack rope and ER rope is literally just one ult. You still perform the same amount of basics, you just get to do one extra ult on ER rope, but the overall damage is really awful and not worth it. So even with 3 turn ults, attack person will do better given you manage your skill points. Even outside of Tingyun teams, I will not recommend running ER rope because the damage drop off is not worth it in that case either. As for the substats, aim for a minimum of 129 speed overall or 134 if you are min maxing. Make sure that you have 70% crit rate on the stat screen for the two piece arena and then get as much crit rate, crit damage, and attack percent as possible. Let's get the 3 star LCs out of the way first. The base attacks for 3 star light cones are very low and IL really wants attacks, so they're really not worth mentioning. For the 4 star light cones, there's not many grey ones except under the blue sky, but that's at high superimposition. At superimposition 5, if you do manage to get the passive up and running, it can compete with the 5 star options. For Secret WoW, it is hard to keep the passive up consistently. The BPLC Nowhere to Run has the same base attack as Aeon, but the passive does not provide enough damage. 5 star options include his signature, which is his best in slot at S1. Aeon S5 will be the best F2P choice, and it comes very close to the signature with its passive active. Blades and Clara's Light Cones are very close to each other. Although Blade's Light Cone has crit rate, the passive only buffs one attack per turn. So when using basic into ult combo, only the basic will get buffed. Here is your LC ranking. Keep in mind this could vary by a percent or two depending on the build. In my case, the signature LC is better than Aeon S5 by about 8-9% and only about 4-5% better if Aeon's passive is kept up. Now that we understand what to equip Isle with, let's talk about his possible teams. I'm gonna start with the sustain option first. Now obviously Luocha is gonna be your best bet for the solo sustain choice. After Luocha, you're just left with Natasha, Bailu, or Japard. All of these have issues like Natasha may not heal you enough without spending skill points, Bailu may end up doing the same, and on top of that she doesn't have a cleanse. Your part can be hard to build faster than your IL in order to generate skill points because of his low base speed and has anti-synergy with some units like Tingyun, who you want to build high speed on, and Branya with her advance forward as his shields will go away after 3 turns. For better options, you'll just have to wait for Lynx and Fushuan in the latter half. I'm not gonna recommend March 7th and Fire MC as their ability to solo sustain just isn't as good as others. You can opt to go for two sustain options but you're gonna lose out on a lot of damage. Moving on to the Nihility option, after tossing aside the dot characters, you're just left with Wealth, Silver Wolf, and Pella. On Wealth, you want to ideally use a skill every turn and that simply doesn't work with IL. Next up is Silverwolf, who I will strictly recommend in single target content. 
she can 3 turn ult with tutorial LC at S5 with a skill and 2 basics when equipped with just 2 piece 1 whack. She can do the same with 3 basics on a 5 star ER rope. Now her implant can be tricky depending on the enemy, even with Yu Kong and Luocha on the team it's still a 50-50 for imaginary implant when facing a non-quantum weak enemy. Even if the enemy has quantum weakness the team is not going to function well because of the massive skill point issue. Silverwolf's skill has good potential in breaking but Ayel does that very well already so it doesn't add much value. Rather than that, I would recommend to use her skill for the 10% resistance down a turn or two before Isle would break in order to get more value out of the skill. When it comes to two targets, she simply doesn't have the means to have her ult active on both enemies at the same time, which is why I'm not going to recommend her in this case. In my opinion, the most consistent choice for Nihility would be Pella, even at E0. Pella can 2 turn ult with the same LC without the need of using her skill. She is ultra skill point positive with AoE defense down. And starting from the next MLC her technique will have very good value. So for the relics I'll recommend 4 piece wind on both characters over 4 piece speed as it doesn't affect your action values as much. 2 piece broken keel for the planar and for the main stats on relics body piece can be EHR or defensive option. Boots you definitely want to go speed, link rope you should be going ER rope, and for the spear it can be a defensive option. Silver Wolf wants to use her LC while Pella can choose between that and the Pearl LC. Pella can 2 turn ult on Silver Wolf LC and 3 turn ult on Pearl LC. I will actually recommend using the Pearl LC at S3 over the Silver Wolf one as it ends up providing more damage to your DPS on average. On top of that, when transitioning into a new wave, the enemy doesn't have any debuffs, so Pella cannot proc her talent or the Silver Wolf Light Cone passive. But this doesn't affect the uptime of Pearl passive as it procs the talent right after attacking. And the reason why I say S3 for Pearl is because of the higher base chance to apply the debuff, allowing you to build more speed and effect res in your substats. I'll talk more about Pella in the tips section. Finally, let's talk about the harmony options. Personally, I haven't done Asta Calcs, but to consistently 2 turn ult, she would need to be strictly skill point negative, which does not work with IL. Now, Bronya is also SP negative, making her a bad pair, but if you do happen to have her E1 and her Light Cone, she can in fact function as it allows for more SP usage. This is the rotation for E1, S1, Bronya in the first 5 cycles. I have assumed that E1 procs one time and does not the next time and repeat. This is obviously not going to be the case every time as it just comes down to the E1 RNG. But if you're planning to run her, you want to equip IL with attack boots. Ronya herself can be on 4 piece wind and I'm not sure about running one whack here specifically because if you fail the E1 on turn 1, you only have 2 skill points with IL. However, you can use the 4 piece healing set on your sustain to have the extra SP in this case. Also, Bronya is valuable in the sense that if Isle himself gets CC'd, she can cleanse and action forward him. I haven't done calcs on this rotation as it is mostly RNG, but given good RNG it has the potential to be one of the best teams in terms of damage. Next up is Yu Kong. Now her I will not recommend before E6 as E6 allows her to activate her buffs without using her skill and generate one skill point for IL every 3 turns. She gives an unconditional 12% imaginary damage boost to your IL which is very nice. Now this is going to be the rotation for the first 5 cycles. You can see that at the end IL is unbuffed by Yu Kong as she has to use a basic for IL to use the max enhanced basic. Up until 6 actions this is going to be fine with planetary rendezvous but after that you will need to do 1 skill and 2 basic and you will be 16 energy short from 3 turn ulting on that light cone. If the battle is long I would suggest using meshing cogs for 3 turn ults consistently but if it is short then planetary rendezvous will do fine. If you want to do 2 skill plus basic every single time for 3 turn ults you need 179 speed on your SP generators which is unreasonably high. Also, she cannot run 4 piece wind as she could get desynced but you can probably run 4 piece speed on her. She needs to be 1 speed point or a few higher than IL. 
My biggest gripe is that if he or Ayel get CC'd, it could totally mess up your action order and Yukong can no longer buff Ayel with her skills. This can happen even with Yukong's debuff resistance choice as it applies one time per two turns and it may happen to be on cooldown. Now let's talk about our last harmony unit and then see how Yukong compares. In my opinion, Tingyun is going to be Ayel's most consistent pair. She is mostly skill point positive, buffs attack that Ayel needs, gives damage percent, and 50 energy consistently. With Machine Cogs S5, her A6 Trace, and 2 piece Wanwak with 5 star ER rope, she can 3 turn ult with a skill and 2 basics. Let's look at the rotation with Tingyun. Up to 5 cycles per wave, Tingyun can allow Ayel to 2 turn ult even without her E6. You start with 85 energy on Ayel, and after using Tingyun ult, you are at 135. So your first turn will be a basic into ult combo, and after using your ult, you are at 5 out of 140 energy. Two turns later, with two max basics, he will be at 85 energy. With a Tingyun ult, that will boost you up to 135. So you are 5 energy off from using an ult. You can get this 5 energy from either using Signature LC, or E6 Tingyun, or ER Rope, but I'm not going to recommend that, or getting hit from anything one singular time, or defeat a low tier enemy. The higher MOC stages have elites and bosses that spam AoE and blast attacks on your team. Even single target is plausible due to Isle's high taunt value. So satisfying the hit condition for 5 energy one time every 2 turns in practice will be very plausible. Even if you don't have 2 turn ult, you are guaranteed to 3 turn ult and you'll just be missing out on 1 ult overall in 5 cycles. So, point is that Tingyun allows you to conserve a lot of skill points, making IL use only around 2 skill points per turn, giving you more leeway for the skill points to be spent by your nihility to use their skills or healers to cleanse or emergency heal. Also, Ayel in every single one of his turns has both the attack buff and the damage percent buff from Tingyun. Now let's compare Tingyun and Yukong. Let's assume that we are in a long battle in higher MOC. So both the harmony units will be on Machine Cogs S5. We are comparing 50% attack plus 50% damage bonus versus 80% attack plus 12% damage bonus. Ayel will benefit around the same from both of these. Yukong will edge out with the ult advantage, but keep in mind that without his LC, Isle will be doing 3-4 to four turn ults with Yukong, and Yukong will not buff Isle every time with her ult on the turn where he will do a basic and ult. On the other hand, you are consistently 2-3 to three turn ulting with Tingyun while conserving skill points. After 4-5 to five cycles, Yukong is forced to do 1 skill and 2 basics rotation, meaning she isn't buffing Isle that much later on, while Tingyun always has her buffs active on Isle and thus ending up being more valuable. But what if we put both Tingyun and Yukong on the same team? Well, it turns out that this could potentially work. This rotation ends up doing more damage than the Pella variant, but will probably fail in practice due to not having skill points for emergency heal or cleanse, and any CC or change to action order will make Yukong almost useless. Now, is there a possibility to run a character that could fit in the slot in case you don't have E6 Yukong or E1 S1 Branya, and in case your Tingyun and Silver Wolf are busy on the other team? There is indeed Clara. Unlike Blade, she actually generates skill points with her basics. The problem with using Clara though is that Isle is imaginary and he breaks fast, disabling Swarog from using counter as much as he would normally do, so it may not be as good. However, she may function better if you are brute forcing content where the enemy does not have imaginary weakness. So overall, for the teams, Isle plus Sustain plus Pella or Silver Wolf in AoE and Silver Wolf and Single Target, plus Ting Yun is going to be the most consistent team. You can see more damage potential in the Ting Yun plus E6 Yukong variant or even the E1 S1 Branya one. Welcome to the Whale section, where we'll be covering his Eidolons. I have done calcs for his E1 and E2, which I will be discussing, but after that, it's pure fields crafting. E1 allows his talent to now stack up to 100% from 60% and after each hit, it now increases by 20% instead of 10%. This gives him a lot of damage percent, allowing him to opt for an attack percent sphere specifically at E1. 
The damage increase is around 13% from E0 with Aeon S5 as the common light cone. From E0 Aeon S5 to E1 S1, it is around a 25% increase. E2 pretty much makes him a different unit as it makes his ult function like So Shang's ult. You basically advance forward by 100%, meaning it's another turn that you get after ulting. And you gain an extra Squama stack. The ult normally gives you 2 stacks, so now it gives you 3 for a free max basic right after the ultimate. Do you know that since this is action forward, this counts as a separate turn and his E2 will be almost worthless if you do an ult on his turn without using the basic first. Ideally, you want to do a max basic into ult into another max basic. Also, you want to run attack percent boost and imaginary damage boost on the sphere. The rotation for E2 plus will look something like this. I would recommend running strictly Ting Yun here as it is more skill point intensive. The damage increase is around 29% from E1 to E2 and around 45% from E0 to E2 with Aeon S5 as the common light cone. And as for the signature, it is as shown in the table. As E3 gives him more motion value on the basic and more crit damage from the skill. E4 makes it so that the crit damage buffs from the skill will persist until the next turn. So you pretty much have permanent 52.8% crit damage at max level after the first basic in the battle without it needing to stack up. E5 gives more motion value on the ult and more damage percent from the talent. E6 increases the imaginary resistance penetration by 20% and up to 60% at 3 stacks on his next max basic attack for every ult that is used by another ally. To put this into perspective, let's say you'd normally do X damage and let's say that the enemy has imaginary weakness, so you will be doing X times 1 minus 0% damage, which is just X damage where the resistance is 0% as the enemy is weak to imaginary. Now if you have max stacks on his E6, the damage changes to X times 1 plus 60%, increasing his damage by a flat 60% which is massive. This will give you more value from resistance penetration when facing non-imaginary weak enemies and imaginary resistant enemies, but of course if the enemy is already weak to imaginary, you do more damage there. You can ult pretty often with Ting Yun, Pella and Luocha, giving his E6 a lot of value. Overall, I'd say that his E2 and E6 are his best Eidolons. This is going to be the advanced tips and build section. For his combos, using a max basic into ult will be better than using ult into max basic by around 8-10%. to The reason for this is because you fully stack both damage percent and crit damage with your basic and then your ult with a big motion value will hit harder with these buffs. With Ting Yun, use this combo almost every time unless you can do a basic into ult the turn right after with Ting Yun ulting in the middle. This may be a rare occurrence but I just wanted to point it out. For other pairs you may want to use ult into basic whenever you have it in order to conserve skill points and stack up energy for the next ult. And of course in cases where you need emergency sustain and are low on skill points, use ult into basic for more skill point usage by your sustain. Next, I want to talk about Pella more. Starting from the next MOC, her technique will be huge. If you start with her technique, you can basic into ult on turn 1 on Pella with the tutorial LC at level 9 talent with 5 star ER rope. Unfortunately, for the poor light cone, you will need to scale into ult at level 7. So with the tutorial light cone, you have 60% defense down for 2 turns and with the pearl, you have 72-76% to defense down depending on the super imposition. If you start with Pella's technique, you don't get the Squama stack on IL from his technique. For that, you need to start battle with IL. So, with poor Light Cone having to skill on Pella and also Ting Yun and then basic on sustain, leaves your IL with two skill points on his first turn. Optimally, you could just use the four piece healing set for the extra skill point to use a max basic attack on IL for the first turn for this very specific scenario, which I will be using personally. 
For E0 Tingyun, you want to have a minimum of 160 speed for 2 turn ults on IL with 134 speed, up to 5 cycles total per wave. Reaching 160 speed on Tingyun is honestly not as bad as you think. You need 17 speed from substats when using 2p speed which is 4.25 speed for 4 pieces and I'm not even counting the ER rope here. You can use wind set alternatively with 148 speed. So either use 4 piece musketeer or 2 piece musk plus 2 piece speed for the attack percent and speed or just use 4 piece wind. For every plus 1 speed that IL has from 134 you will need plus 1 to 2 speed on Ting Yun. As for E1 Ting Yun, if you are 2 turn ulting on IL with 127 speed, you need a minimum of 162 speed on Ting Yun. This translates to 149 speed minimum on the wind set for Ting Yun. Again, for every plus 1 speed that IL has from 127, you will need plus 1 to 2 speed on Ting Yun. A level 80 Ting Yun with level 80 machine cogs with all the attack trace notes unlocked, 2 piece musketeer and plus 15 attack body and sphere will need 3.66% attack and subs putting your Ting Yun at 2300 attack for an attack buff of 575 to your IL at level 10 skill. A brief little detail I'd like to mention is that if you start with this technique, you get one free attack stack from the Aeon Light Cone. His damage potential is looking incredibly strong. I mean just look at the motion value on his basics that he can cast every turn and all the self buffs that he has. You can expect him to dish out 50 to 60k with his basics and that's just single target. If we consider 3 targets he can easily reach over 100k per turn and that's absolutely insane. His potential in brute forcing non-imaginary weak content is also quite impressive despite having 25% less damage because of the innate resistance and losing 24% crit damage from his final trace. Expect people to call him the new ceiling for DPS. He truly is a unit of all time that Hoyoverse has made. In the beta his LC got buffed and his final trace got changed from CR to CD but it's still the same CV. Well, fingers crossed his numbers don't get changed on release considering they didn't touch his kit's numbers at all in the beta. So that event is highly unlikely on release. As for my final thoughts on him, he's going to be a top tier damage healer that even F2Ps will benefit from, so I'd say his pull value is pretty solid at the moment. I have dreamt about the future characters and I didn't see any 5 star imaginary DPS character in the next 6 months at least, so you could totally grab him now. Other than his damage potential, he feels very restrictive at the moment in terms of forming a team. If you don't have E6 Yukong or even S1 Branyo, you're literally left with Ting Yun as your only harmony option. Hopefully Hanya and or Hanabi will make a great pair for IL allowing for a lot more options. Well, that was quite exhausting to make this video and working on the math behind it, but I actually had a lot of fun doing this. Hope all of this was informative. This was sort of rushed, so I might have missed something or have gone wrong somewhere or the other. Hopefully not. Do let me know in the comments below if you have any further questions and I'll get to you as soon as possible. Thank you all for watching and I'll most probably be making another video for Fushuan and links that are coming out in the second half. If I see a well enough reception for this video. Peace.